Hello, my name is Errol, and in this video for the Reality Escape Convention, we are going to discuss the five things new designers should know about escape room puzzle creation. Number one, read about escape room design. Now, this isn't just me telling you to Google it. The thing is, there are a number of resources out there, and a lot of them free, that will talk about escape room puzzle design. Do you know Brett Keener? He... I kind of keep him in my house in case of emergencies. Well, this man, he has a website, and it's called thatguywiththepuzzles.com. Look at this page. See all of those mechanical puzzles? That's only half of the arsenal he keeps sequestered in his clandestine puzzle dimensional pockets. If Nicolas Cage needs another national treasure movie, he needs to go no further than to discover the wonders hidden about all over Brett's body. On this site is this living document, the escape room design links. This Google Doc is still being maintained and updated with online escape room design documents. There are a lot of documents to read through here, and as I said before, a lot of them are free. And it also has a number of books that you can purchase that talk about escape room and puzzle design. I cannot in 40 minutes cover experiential design, or narrative design, or puzzle design, or set design, all of which are subsets of escape room design. You have it hard. But what I can do is point you in the right direction. There's not only this document, there is a large community of escape room owners, of enthusiasts, of creators and designers who are willing to share their experience with you. You can check out the Escape Room Discord. You can check out the Escape Room Facebook Enthusiast Group. There are a lot of enthusiasts, escape room startup groups. There's many of them. And if you go there, you will find people willing to talk to you about escape room design and escape room puzzle design. I'll talk forever about escape room puzzle design, but I don't have forever. I only have 40 minutes because David and Lisa only gave me 40 minutes. <sighs> Now, before you tune out because you think I'm just giving you reading assignments, I kind of did, but I am going to cover many other things. And in preparation of this video, I put out a poll on the Escape Room Enthusiast Facebook group. And that poll was, if there is a piece of advice you could give to new puzzle designers, what would it be? The results were not surprising, really, and only solidified the topics I was going to talk about. So. Go you poll people, you are amazing. Number two, you don't need unique puzzles. At one escape room facility, every time we completed one of their rooms, they always asked us with heightened expectation whether or not we saw anything new. And our response was, um, I love you. Well, maybe that wasn't. Our response. That's usually the response I give my daughter when she shows me art that she thinks I should like, and I don't. Don't squash your kids' dreams, folks, unlike me. A common goal for many designers, whether new or veteran, is to create a unique and original puzzle. Don't. In fact, you, you probably won't be able to do it. And that sounds harsh. I mean, you might be able to do it. It's just that people have been creating puzzles for decades. Besides, that shouldn't be your goal. Your goal isn't to create the most original and unique escape room on the planet. Your goal is to create a good escape room. Why? Because think of who your target audience is. And here's a hint. It's not me. I'm an enthusiast. I have done a lot of escape rooms. And yes, it is exciting when I see something new and unique that I've never seen before. But, but it's not going to happen that often. And I'm not your target demographic. Your audience is the mainstream public and their minds are blown by the littlest things. Whoa, black light. Now you may be thinking, but Errol, people have been writing stories for centuries and we have new stories. People have been composing music for centuries and we have new music. But do we? Do we really? You know, music, 
art, stories, baking, pet grooming, interpretive Klingon dance, whatever creative endeavor you are doing, all of them have basic building blocks that make up the whole. An escape room really only has a limited amount of puzzle types to draw from. When you play escape rooms and when you play a lot of them, eventually you're going to start to recognize everything. The reason we do well in escape rooms is not because we're so smart. I am so smart. It's because it's because we have done a number of them and in its experience. As I said, nothing is really that new. We still have fun in an escape room. Don't get me wrong, but a lot of the puzzles are the same. They just have a very pretty or different shiny face on them. And that's good too. In one of the earliest papers that Scott Nicholson wrote, do you remember it? It is called Peeking Behind the Locked Door, a survey of escape room facilities. In it, you will find a table of types of puzzles in escape room. This list, of course, isn't exhaustive and you may endeavor to find new escape room types, but again, that's not the point. How you integrate a puzzle type into your experience, that can be the original offering you bring. How well did you design the puzzle so they fit elegantly into the theme of the escape room? To be honest, I don't find creating puzzles to be the hard part of creating an escape room. Most designers don't start with the puzzles first. I, I actually don't know that. Most of the designers I know don't start with the puzzles first because we have a store of puzzle types in our utility belt. It's like we're puzzle Batman. And then when the theme calls for it, we will pull a puzzle out that might fit. And everywhere we go, it's like, ooh, there's a puzzle that looks, there's something that looks like it could be a puzzle. And then we grab it and we store it. When I create an event, I figure out what the theme is. I will figure out what the structure is, how the players will flow through the game, and also all the different experiences that will give the player that wow moment. That's what I work on first. If you start with puzzles first, then you kind of run into the problem where you're trying to shoehorn it into a game where it might not make sense. Having said that, there are a lot of puzzles that can be themed in different ways. And so that's why, as I said before, I just keep a store of puzzles. And then when I see a puzzle will fit a theme, brilliant, I'll put it in. I suggest to you that you have a puzzle idea notebook and you can keep it it doesn't have to be real, like you don't have to have a real notebook. I mean, some of you might like those real things like a pen and pencil. And keep your eye open for anything that can hide a puzzle. Sometimes I'll walk around and I can see, oh wow, I could easily see how this ordinary object could hide these numbers in it or could hide words in it. Ooh, look at that. That could hide a pig pen cipher. To be honest, I don't think I've ever used a pig pen cipher in any of my puzzles, but that's because I think probably the best use of I've ever seen of a pig pen cipher was Darren Miller's puzzle that he did with a pig pen cipher. And I couldn't top that, so I don't bother. To round this up, you don't need unique puzzles. Focus instead on integrating your puzzles into the narrative and theme of your game. Start with creating the structure, the game flow, the narrative beats within the game, and then add puzzles that fit. Always keep your eyes open for puzzle ideas. Three, your puzzles are too hard. Puzzle difficulty is subjective. Yes, I hear that all the time, but that doesn't mean that it's just some wild magic black art that you'll never be able to figure out. There are still rules and if you are a new designer, your, your puzzles are too hard. I'll just tell you that up front right now. They're too hard. And the reason your puzzles are too hard is because it doesn't require any skill to make a puzzle difficult. That doesn't mean you don't have skill, but you're just new and, and you don't have any skill. Hard puzzles are easy to make. They are so easy, a baby can do it. Why is this baby crying? I don't know. Is it hungry? No, it doesn't want the bottle. Is it poopy? No, but I'm not going to stick my fingers in there. Why is it crying? I don't know. Rotten babies don't have kids. And you may be thinking, but Errol, that's not a puzzle. Well, compared to some of the puzzles that I've seen in escape rooms, it may as well be. 
Creating a hard puzzle is easy to do. Anyone can do it. Creating a hard puzzle that is good, that is well designed, that is fair, that requires an intense amount of skill, of experience, of creativity, of luck, and hard work. A good, well designed, difficult puzzle is challenging to make. So don't do it. What? Did you just hear correctly? Yes, yes, you did hear correctly. Don't make hard puzzles. I don't, I don't know why escape rooms try to make hard puzzles. Why? Because of who your target audience is again. And it's not me. It's not puzzle hunt people. And I'm not even a puzzle hunt people. These puzzle hunt people, they'll spend 32 hours, no sleep, probably longer than that, working on the same puzzle. Well, okay, maybe working on multiple puzzles. Puzzle hunt people, they're intense. But they're a niche group. And I'm pretty sure in your town, you're not going to find a lot of them all just foaming at the mouth for esoteric ciphers to solve. No, you are going to focus on people who barely touch puzzles, but they want an exciting experience like they see in the movies. Your target audience are the people who don't have the excellent taste of doing an escape room on a weekly or daily basis. They don't do escape room marathons, but those are a lot of fun. You know, I wrote an article about difficulty in escape rooms. And the thing is, I just don't trust designers to make challenging puzzles. And the reason I don't trust designers to make challenging puzzles is because when they think they have to make it harder, they will increase the amount of tedium required to do that puzzle. And, and I, I don't want to do that. Have you ever done an escape room and thought to yourself, oh, this feels like homework. Why am I doing homework in an escape room? Or have you ever done an online escape room and then you had to order a purposely obtuse avatar around and they just don't know what to do? And it's like trying to get your mom on a Zoom call. And if I wanted to be help support, I would have applied to be a help support person. No, I just do not want to do that. It's no fun and it's tedious. And of course, I understand that every person's definition of tedium, it, it varies and is subjective. So obviously you'll have to beta test. But if you want to do more challenging, then just add in more puzzles. There is another reason why your puzzles are too hard. Actually, there are many reasons why my puzzles are too hard. And that is something called the illusion of transparency. There's a Wikipedia article about it. The illusion of transparency is a tendency for people to overestimate the degree to which their personal mental state is known by others. In other words, nobody can read your mind. Obviously, nobody can know my mental state. I don't know my mental state. Ever read people's comments and you hear things like, the puzzles don't make any sense. The puzzle solution is too much in the designer's mind. I heard the solution and I still don't know what they're getting at. How does it even work? Puzzles that tend to not make sense are usually the ones that require an aha insight. Eureka! Who says Eureka? I don't know. Anyway, they usually require a correlation or some kind of connection between the clues the players find and what the players need to do. And a lot of times, those two don't connect at all. A designer may think, oh, it's obvious what they need to do. And the players will go, so I have a cat bus and facial oil wipes. What the f Sometimes there is no connection other than what is in your mind because you are weird. And other times there are connections, but there are too many of them because you've made the answers ambiguous. I got an unpad. It wants a date. What's today's date? What? You can't do that yourself? It's August 22nd, 822. No, that doesn't work. Uh, 22-8 then. No, no, that doesn't work too. 2208? Nope. 0822? What the f? You know what's helpful? Asking why. Why is that the solution? Or 
Why is that solution better than all the other solutions that seem to fit the clues you gave me? If the only answer to the why is, because I said so, then, 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 that's, then that's horrible. For example, imagine you had to round up suspects for a crime. Uh, obviously it'd be for a crime. Why else would you round up suspects? On the suspect sheet, profile sheets, you have a lot of information, like their name, their hair color, their height. And for some inane reason, the designers decide that the answer to a three digit lock would be to add up the heights of all the suspects. Even now, I hope that you're thinking, why? Why would I add up the heights? of the suspects. When have I ever watched a police crime procedural and the captain yells out, get me their heights and add them up. And while you're at it, find the complementary colors of their eye colors. That makes no sense and it's dumb because there's no common connection between a list of heights and adding them together other than the fact that they are numbers. Ooh, I have numbers. What can you do with numbers? You can add them. What a great puzzle. No, because you can do many other things to numbers. Putting two disjointed ideas together is not clever. Unless you make it clever, and you can. Maybe the suspects are acrobats, and they all stood on each other's shoulders to reach a window, and now the heights are important. You might need to add together, minus the head heights. Uh, don't make that a puzzle. But that could be a narrative that would explain why you would have to add the heights. And then, of course, that goes back to the asking why. Anyway, in the end, I don't make your puzzles difficult. I am notorious for that. And I want to create puzzles that can be solved by people who are not the puzzle elite. That's challenging. I still, I'm still trying. So to recap, your puzzles are too hard. Don't make them tedious, don't make the answers ambiguous, and don't jam disjointed ideas together for no reason. Clue should strongly point to an answer. Number four, your audience's experience is the top priority. Many designers reference Jesse Schell's book, The Art of Game Design, A Book of Lenses. In it, he writes about experiences. As tricky as experiences can be, creating them is all a game designer cares about. Of course, there is a wide area that a player's experience covers. If we were to go back to the poll that I asked about in Facebook, we would see this. Player fun should be your focus. And that makes sense, right? Obviously, Players having fun is important, but sometimes we don't design that way. Sometimes we design because we want to have fun. And there's nothing wrong with us having fun. I have fun all the time, but the main goal should be for our players. There is another designer out there, and he wrote this about video game design, but this applies to escape room design as well. His name is Bruce Shelley, and he wrote... The player should have the fun, not the designer, programmer, or computer. Sometimes we have a hard time of letting go. We have a hard time letting go of certain concepts that we love. We can't kill our darlings. We have personal preferences. Maybe it's our pride. It's hard being a designer. And so we have to go back to who our audience is. And I know I keep harping on this. But it's marketing 101, right? Who is our target audience? And it's impossible to make a game that everyone likes. When I, when I try to, when I create the Cryptex hunt, I think, can I make an experience that both veteran solvers and brand new people can both get the same enjoyment from? And that's hard, no. No, it's, it's near impossible. And I, and I struggle every year. I mean, I still try, but it's, it's a challenge. So don't make the same mistakes I do. Make a game that caters to the market you're in. And remember, enthusiasts aren't your audience. They also have their own likes and dislikes and their personal preferences. And enthusiasts aren't game designers. Some of them are, but not all of them, not the majority of them. And sometimes they can't tell the difference between personal preference and bad game design. 
But let's be clear here, there is such a thing as bad game design. If you get a bad negative review about your game, you can't just say, ah, oh, it's their personal preference. No, it might be because your game is horrible. And that's something that you should look at and hopefully improve. So how can you tell? So how can you tell if it's bad game design or if it's personal preference? With testing, with experience, and sometimes you can't. So what should you do? Well, at the very least, make your puzzles fair. If a player makes a wrong choice because of limited information, don't punish them. Don't punish them with more tedium or penalties in time or mockery, punches in the face. It's not their fault. Players feel frustrated if they no longer feel in control of winning the game. For example, to this day, I hate lockout saves. And what is a lockout safe, you're asking? Well, I'll tell you. A lockout safe is a safe, an electronic safe, actually, and it has a numeric keypad. And then you try and type in your answer, boop, 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 and it goes, Meh, and it goes, Meh, because you got it wrong. And why do you have it wrong? Well, there are many reasons why you may have gotten it wrong. Maybe the little buttons are so small or the contacts don't really work. So you try again, boop, 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 Meh, you got it wrong in. And then after three tries, it locks you out. Maybe it'll lock you out for 30 seconds. Maybe it'll lock you out for a minute. Once, I had a lockout safe that locked you out for 20 minutes. 20 minutes? That's brutal. Are you kidding me? And the reason I hate lockout safes is because lockout safes are made for people who know the answer. They're not made for people who have just a good idea about the answers. If, if you are creating a puzzle with a lockout safe, Make sure that the person knows the answer 100% before they're putting it in. You can design a puzzle so that a person knows 100% they have the right answer. But if you make it one of those, oh, it could be this or it could be that, then that's horrible. And the design is trash and I hate lockout safes. I'm not saying players shouldn't be challenged. So don't get me wrong here. Players want to be challenged and sometimes they like being frustrated because when they overcome it, they are elated with joy on how smart they are. However, players need to be in control of overcoming those challenges. As a designer, your job is to challenge the player, but not defeat them. You are not there to revel in their defeat. If you've ever known a designer that laughs when their players fail at their game, uh, then that's the wrong attitude to take. When I watch people solve my games, I'm like on the edge of my seat because I want them to solve it. I don't want my puzzles to beat them because that's not the goal. The goal of my puzzles are to be solved. If I didn't want them to be solved, I would have gone into cybersecurity or something. Now, there are a lot of books and articles out there that talk about providing fun for your players. That alone could take up more than 40 minutes. Really, you could have talks on this. I mean, there probably are talks on this. You can take a look at all the past speakers. You can take a look at all the current speakers and see all the great talks that are happening. See, see what I did there? Passed on responsibility. I'm good at that. Number five, beta test. Beta test, beta test. Look at this poll. I'll bring up this poll again. What is at the top? Beta testing. Is your game solvable? Is it too hard? Does it fit the audience? Beta test and iterate. Do you know how long it takes to play? Do you know if people need hints? Do you know where they get stuck? Beta test and iterate. You don't know what you don't know. You will not be able to understand the mind of your players. It is a wild and undiscovered land. Give yourself time in the development process to beta test. Don't skip it. When you eventually run your game, and you will have to run your game, then you will find even more things and iterate then. But you have to make sure that you don't deliver to your players a broken game. That's not fair to them. They've paid money for it. If they didn't, well, no, then you still want to give them a good game. But at least you didn't rip them off. Finding beta testers, though, can be tricky. Understandable. I mean, you have your friends and you have your family. At least I hope you have friends. And the thing is, they still want to remain your friends. Because they know how testy you get when they try to take the mic away from you during karaoke, right? But they aren't reliable. 
I usually go to escape room forums or anyone in the escape room community and I will ask them for their beta testing skills. However, I do admit those communities lean more towards the enthusiast spectrum. The great thing about enthusiasts is that you will find out if your puzzles are solvable, that's important, and you'll also find out if it's too hard for them, then it's totally too hard for the mainstream public, and you don't want to do that to them. Getting people who aren't enthusiasts, however, will be challenging. You can try game-adjacent experiences like the board game community. Maybe they would be willing. You can see if there are any local meetups that would be willing to try in your area. This is, of course, for in-person games. When you beta test, it's great to be there in person and watch them. Yes, you can actually ask them to talk about their experiences later on. They can write it down. But are they going to remember everything in the moment? No. Sometimes there will be some parts you will find that was so exciting or so frustrating that they'll forget all the other parts, right? So it's great to watch them in person. And if you can find someone that can vocalize their thoughts, if they can speak through every mental process that they're going through as they are solving your puzzle, that is gold. That is brilliant. If you happen to have an online game and they are willing to record themselves, that's great too. If they also are streamers and they have an audience, and then you can even see what suggestions people are giving to them in the chat, Amazing. You want all of that. Still, if you're finding that beta testers are too scared to hurt your feelings because maybe you have a really angry look about you, well, Jesse Shell, in his book, gives this advice. You can say this to your beta testers. I need your help. This game has some real problems, but we're not sure what they are. Please, if there's anything you don't like, it will be a great help to me if you let me know. How you beta test is important. And again, the best way is by watching them. And you're not there to influence them with a yes or a no. You're not there to answer their questions unless, of course, your game is broken or at the very beginning in the alpha stages. No, it is like those cop shows with the one-way mirror and they can't see you because you are just there to observe them. It's like the prime directive if you're Star Trek fans. And remember, even correcting them or sending them down the right path. If I do that as a game designer, then how do I know that there are open all these open paths that I'm not seeing? Is the answer a red turtle? No. And now you're probably wondering, where did you get red turtle from? Did I put something in this puzzle that led you to think that it's about a red turtle? Are you just obsessed with turtles? I don't know. And so I have to find this out. And when I watch them, there are more than just the puzzles that I worry about. Here are a number of questions that I ask or I think to myself when I'm watching them. And of course, you will have many other questions. But, you know, it is good to have these on your mind while they are playing. Are they having troubles getting started? Did I mess up on boarding or on ramping? Can they not find trailheads to puzzles? Are they having troubles with the flow? Do they not know how to proceed? Do they not know where to go next? Are they understanding the concept, the entire mechanic of the game? Have they lost the big picture? Where are they getting stuck? Why are they getting stuck? Are there common patterns players keep doing? Are they having troubles with the interface? Do they have troubles manipulating things? Are they frustrated? Why are they frustrated? Are they frustrated with themselves or are they frustrated with me? Are they tired? Are they losing motivation to play? Why? Are they engaged? Are some players just doing nothing? And are they having fun? Do they celebrate when they solve a puzzle? Or do they say, oh, how is anyone going to get that? For myself, I'm at a stage of puzzle design where I really only worry about two things. And I've mentioned those two things before. One, is the puzzle ambiguous? Do players find multiple answers and I arbitrarily made one correct? And two, is the puzzle too opaque? Is the connection between the clues I gave and the answer too weak? Sometimes when I am watching a player play one of my puzzles, they find a thread and they pull on that thread 
and that thread is very exciting and so they follow that thread and before you know it they're off on their own little threaded world of linen and fun and I didn't want them to follow that thread. In fact, I didn't even know that thread was there. I was off with another piece of thread, knitting sweaters. But no, they went off and made some sort of strange onesie. And that's not what I wanted them to do. And now I can see how the analogy has fallen apart. The point is, I need to cut that thread. If people are finding these threads that point to other solutions, and I never made any accommodation for that to be a solution. However, it's a viable solution because it makes sense with all the clues I gave them. Then I have to cut it out. For example, I made a puzzle and it's this puzzle. You can solve it if you want, but I'm going to spoil it in a few minutes. The flavor text or the helpful clues that might indicate what to do says, When I'm blue, my pick me up is to think opposite. And then we have this multicolored text that says, if you're feeling down, remember me. Ha <laughs> ha, take from that what you will, but don't ever run away because I'll be coming for you. Love always, pal. I thought it would be easy and I was wrong. Now there are a number of problems with this puzzle. I know, first there's the colorblind accessibility as well as the eventual external knowledge. When you solve the puzzle, you'll find out why. But the mistake I wanna point out is I incorrectly assumed people would focus on the words first. I wanted them to find the opposite for the words highlighted in blue. A lot of my beta testers did just that. A lot of other beta testers thought the opposite of blue and then focused on red words. Darn it. Puzzle writing is hard. When I am beta testing, I'm not trying to find people who can solve the puzzle. If they can solve it, that's great. And I'm happy that they can. However, I want to find the people that can't solve the puzzles. I'm not here to validate that, oh, I made a good puzzle. No, I want to fix the puzzle so that the majority of people can solve it. A lot of people think differently than I do, and I want to see how those differences affect how they solve puzzles. And then I love analyzing why they can't solve a puzzle. Getting back to my original puzzle with the opposite of the words colored in blue, there's nothing in here that clues that they really should have thought the word and not the color. It can be one or the other, and that's ambiguous. I did not clarify. I need to fix that and it's on me to make it clearer. However, I'm not going to entertain ridiculous notions. Players can come up with wild theories, like maybe they'll look at the text and notice that there are pink words and then they'll notice, oh, it's pink on black and Arrow likes black pink. So obviously it has something to do with K-pop. No, it's not. And there's nothing I can do about that. Oh, and one other thing. I'm also rarely looking for suggestions on how to fix a puzzle. Now, if somebody gives me a suggestion and it's an amazing suggestion, then that's great and I will put it in. However, I usually find if people are trying to solve a puzzle, they too are usually thinking in one way. If they're designers, then they'll think in multiple ways and try to point out all the different ways that a person can mess up my puzzle or how I messed up them because of my puzzle. But I think Neil Gaiman, an author, puts it best. Remember, when people tell you something's wrong or doesn't work for them, they are almost always right. When they tell you exactly what they think is wrong and how to fix it, they are almost always wrong. Again, this doesn't mean I don't listen to suggestions. I have received in the past many suggestions for my puzzles and they were great suggestions and I implemented them immediately. However, one of the skills you will need to develop is discerning between bad puzzle design, and personal preference. Do the players not like your puzzle because of personal preference? And that's a thing that will happen. And you have to be able to tell when it's their personal preference and whether or not it's your bad puzzle design. Heck, sometimes a player is just mad that they can't solve your puzzle. And then they get mad at you. But that's, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. Anyway, I can't stress enough how important beta testing is. And yes, I have pointed out many articles. I've given you many tips in this video, but if you find your target audience loves something you do and it goes against something I've said, 
then hey, listen to your audience. That's who your target market is anyway, and it's not me. But you'll get a better idea of that through beta testing. In conclusion, I want to talk about one last thing about creating a great puzzle. Sort of relates to point number four about how fun is important. Fun is actually part of the five Fs of design. You won't really find that anywhere. I just made it up for this talk. But hey, I wanted a mnemonic and this one fit. Is your game fun? Are your puzzles fair? And do they fit the theme? Are your hosts friendly? And are your props fixable and firm? That last one's pretty stretching, I know. But anyway, so as I said before, fun is very subjective. We could spend days talking about that. And fair puzzles that fit the theme was discussed earlier. Is your game friendly? As we have found out with the whole online escape room process, the game host is pivotal to the game experience, to your player's experience. And making sure that you hire people and that you have people that deliver that excellence for your customers is very important. And finally, if you have a local game, you may not know this, but players break everything. They just do. And they don't mean to do it. It's just that things like a lock was not meant to be open non-stop throughout the day. Same thing with batteries. Same thing with flashlights. They weren't meant to be used that intensely. So you have to make sure that your props can be fixed, can be replaced, and you have to make sure that they are durable. That's very important and people don't even realize that the maintenance aspect about an escape room. But again, all of that, all of that is something you will learn when you open up your own escape room. There's much more. There's so much to cover and I've only really touched the surface. I hope you've learned something from this talk, and if not at least, I hope you had fun. I am always available to talk about puzzle design if you have any questions. There are a number of people on the Escape Room Discord that are also willing to talk about puzzle design, and there are many people there that are also willing to beta test for you. It's a great community, and you should really check it out because the people there are amazing, and it's just not me that is quite happy to talk about puzzle design four hours. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.